Awesome. Thank you so much, Matt, for the kind introduction. Um, it's great being here. And today it's my pleasure to talk about visual place recognition using Bion Spider approaches. So in my talk today, I'll cover three key themes. Uh, first of all, low power localization. I'll start out with that. I'll talk about enabling tools, just like um, Josh uh, did with uh, Hollow Oceans. And I'll also talk about underwater perception, surprise, surprise, following um, Josh's talk. Now, let me talk about visual place recognition for those of you uh, who are not aware of it. So the problem statement is that given a large uh, database of images, the map of your environment, and a new incoming query image, you want to uh, recognize where are you, where am I, so you want to find um, the mapped image in the database that is most similar to the query image. However, if you look at this example here, uh, it's a non-trivial task, right? Um, there are images of the same place that look very dissimilar uh, because the environment has changed in some regard. Um, and also there's uh, similar places, uh, some similarly looking places that are geographically very different. Now, um, robot localization has been studied for, for a long time, and I just want to give uh, credit to some of the works. It's impossible to give credit to all the works. Um, but visual place recognition has been used as a loop closure um, component, so Margarita talked about it earlier, and there's been a lot of work around problem framing. Um, framing. Uh, there have been incredible advances uh, in the algorithms used for uh, localization and place recognition. Um, Margarita talked about semantics and how it can be incorporated into the problem and why it's important. Uh, we've seen novel loss functions, and they've been enabled by amazing new large-scale and diverse data sets. And we've seen an emergence of a new scene representation, so Gaussian splits just most recently. However, what you haven't discussed, it's bad news. Um, all of those algorithms have mostly aimed for higher accuracy, and higher accuracy equals better. But if we ca can't frame them and deploy them in the long run, um, then they're not useful. So we have to watch out for the energy efficiency. And um, yeah, that's really like my main uh, message here is that long-term autonomy needs energy efficiency. And later in the talk, I'll um, tell you a little bit about some of the methods that we've um, developed over the last couple of years in that regard. Some people might tell you that SLAM is solved, visual place recognition is solved. Um, tell them you're not asking the right questions and you're not looking at the right data sets. So as one of the many examples uh, where it's an open issue is in underwater robotics, as you can see on the right-hand side. And why is it so difficult? Josh just said there's no GPS. Um, it's basically impossible to um, obtain ground truth. And things are really uh, expensive to annotate, and it's very challenging imagery. And I want to start out um, with the third key theme that I introduced. So that's the uh, marine robotics uh, theme. And we've been very fortunate in working with the Australian Institute for Marine Sciences as part of the Reef Restoration Adaptation Program. Um, and what they do is that they um, take the coral spawn and then they grow them in the lab environment. And then the question they're asking is, um, where should we deploy those ceramic devices that you see there on the left-hand side? Um, so we have to find suitable substrate. And at the moment, um, there's divers going, and they place those coral devices very carefully on suitable substrate. And they can do that. You know, they can deploy a couple of thousands of those devices. However, with uh, climate change and the issues that we are having um, and in the Great Barrier Reef, um, our aim is to deploy 3 million devices annually uh, by 2030. So as you can imagine, um, there's no way that we can you know, just magically come up with uh, more and more divers. So we need to automate this process, and I'll tell you about um, some of the work um, in automatically detecting suitable substrate um, and classifying the substrate and uh, whether we should deploy those devices there or not, and then automatically dispensing um, those devices uh, from a boat. So um, that all comes together with place recognition of as well, right? Because once we have deployed the dev um, those devices, we actually want to keep track on whether the coral um, has grown there over time, and therefore we need place recognition um, in this problem there as well. And we've recently come up with a new benchmark if you want to check it out, um, which is aiming towards um, this long-term uh, place recognition uh, underwater. So. Um, one thing that Josh hasn't mentioned is that it's uh, not only incredibly difficult imagery, but also as opposed to um, Kitty or something on the left-hand side, where each of us can sit down and easily label um, cars, buildings, etc. Um, in underwater images, most of the time, we need domain experts, marine biologists, to annotate those images. Um, so here we see uh, corals, and there's different species of corals, and we actually want to know which uh, corals are in the image. And that is really expensive um, and time-consuming. 
So um, one of the things that we've been exploring is using foundation models, and I feel like uh, a keynote those days is not complete without foundation models. Um, however, what we found is that you can't just use them out of the box, um, and it's really an advantage if you have a human in the loop um, to label those images. So what happens is that the marine biologist sits down, um, and they click on a pixel, um, and then they annotate the class uh, of the coral in this case um, for that particular pixel, and they do this a couple of hundred times uh, per image in the past. And um, the work that I'm briefly introducing here um, enabled you to uh, reduce the number of labels to just a handful or a dozen um, of labels. So really, we're reducing the point labels by up to 98%. So how do we do it? Um, we've got a domain expert in the loop. Uh, we use DynoV2 or one of the other foundation models um, that you want. Um, and then we can obtain a similarity map between the already labeled um, pixels in that image and all the other pixels um, in the image. And we combine that with uh, some kind of distance map to just avoid clustering uh, images in nearby regions. And if you can, uh, can combine those maps, we can uh, find the region with the lowest similarity to already uh, contained labels in that image and feed that back to the domain expert and ask the domain expert um, to label this pixel. Um, and then we can use the uh, obtained augmented ground truth mask to just train a um, traditional semantic uh, segmentation model. So what's the benefit here, right? Um, if you look at this plot, on the x-axis you see the number of point labels um, required. So the further on the left-hand side we are, the better, because it's cheaper for the um, domain ecologist. And on the y-axis, we see the mean intersection of, um, over union, so uh, higher accuracy there is better. Um, and what we see in our red curve, that's um, our proposed method, especially for this uh, setting where we have very few labels, um, we obtain a huge jump in performance compared to um, our previous uh, methods um, there. Um, and can actually, if you qualitatively look at those images, uh, obtain similar augmentation masks uh, using just a handful of pixels compared to previously um, hundreds of pixels. So um, when I started my PhD, and now it's a little bit of a context change, but really I want to pitch to you and the whole community is that we need uh, more work on enabling technologies and making those really easily accessible. It's not enough to just open source your uh, work if no one can use it. Um, and to uh, introduce some of those works, uh, RoboStack um, is, if you haven't heard about it, uh, you can use ROS uh, from any device, whether it's your um, Mac, Windows, laptop, uh, or if you come to my talk tomorrow morning, now you can use it also on your mobile phone, um, which is really cool, I think. Uh, we've also been looking at uh, Visual Slam, and we recently introduced the vSlam lab, uh, which enables you uh, using a single command that you can see there at the bottom to uh, recreate the animation there. Um, so, uh, you know, you can run uh, multiple or many, many Slam methods on many, many Slam data sets, and that allows you to benchmark um, those methods. And then also we've been looking at um, those techniques where uh, you don't have ground truth available, right? Because there's many, many settings uh, where you can't obtain possibly ground truth. And we came up with a method uh, which correlates very strongly with the absolute trajectory error without using any ground truth at all. Um, so you can fine tune your SLAM method um, or benchmark your SLAM systems uh, where no uh, ground truth is available. So let me get back to this annoying flat battery, right? What do we do about this? Um, and uh, we, we use neuromorphic visual place recognition uh, in this particular example. So what is neuromorphic? Um, it's brain inspired, right? Um, and to capture you again, to get you back to um, my mission here, is that we want long-term autonomy and we need energy efficiency for that. Um, and I think there's a huge potential of neuromorphic uh, computing and robotics uh, more generally. So uh, what, are, what are the key components? One of the um, early components there are spiking your networks, right? Um, so most of you will be familiar with uh, deep networks. Um, however, in the spiking your network, uh, the information transmission is very, very sparse. So you only have those binary signals, and the information is kind of contained in the timing of those signals as opposed to the value attached to a spike. Um, and uh, there's an internal memory for each spike. And uh, what is cool about them is that if you have a suitable processor, um, so specialized hardware, um, then we can uh, to implement really energy efficient solutions. Uh, and I want to contrast it to deep networks where any neuron is active at any given time, and it's basically you know, like an um, add multiply um, and some nonlinearity there. 
So what are the other components that we need for a fully neuromorphic place recognition system? On the sensing side, uh, many people have been looking at event cameras. If you're not familiar with it, they don't give you absolute um, intensity information like a conventional phone camera, but instead um, they only transmit the information that has changed, so the um, delta and the log intensity of the image. Then we need the spiking networks, um, and we need a suitable processor. So in this case, uh, it's a SynSense -Syn spec. You can go down to the exhibition hall to check them out. Um, and then, importantly, we're talking about field robotics, right? We actually want to uh, deploy those algorithms in real time. And um, just to introduce the uh, neural network architecture, right, compared to a super, super hundreds of layer um, deep network, what we've got here is like the most uh, simple uh, network that you can possibly imagine with just an input layer, feature layer, and then the output layer, which classifies the different places um, over time. Um, so that's only like 45,000 parameters. Um, you might now ask, how do you actually train those networks, right? The issue is with those spikes, um, derivative, it's more or less all the time zero, um, so it's very hard to do backpropagation. Um, there have been some works on uh, approximating backpropagation um, for spiking neural networks. What we're doing here instead is using a really, really old algorithm called um, STDP, spike time dependent plasticity. If you remember your biology class, what wires together, uh, what fires together, wires together. Um, but we are introducing a trick that you can read um, in our paper, and it's just been accepted to science robotics, uh, where we introduce um, some forced spikes to kind of guide this unsupervised uh, learning process. So the results here, the key takeaway message is that we can uh, achieve comparable performance to um, conventional algorithms, but consume 20 times less energy uh, compared to a implementation on, uh, on a Jetson, um, which I think uh, is really cool. So um, if you say, oh, but I've got all the energy in the world, uh, why should I care about it? Um, if you don't care about energy, you might care about training and inference speeds. Um, and last year at ICRA, we um, presented a very similar spiking neural network scheme where we had, uh, where we trained a, a place recognition algorithm within a single minute, and then you can do inference on it uh, in the order of kilohertz. So uh, to sum up, neuromorphic computing, I think, brings intelligence robots uh, where GPUs can't go from underwater reef restoration to remote infrastructure monitoring. And with that, I'd like to uh, thank all my collaborators, partners, and funding agencies. Um, if you're looking for a PhD, please get in touch, and I'd love to connect with you. Thank you very much. Okay, we have time for one quick question. Any questions from the audience? And I'm sorry I missed the online ones before, but someone figured out how to use them, so I will keep my eye on those. Question, question, question. I've got a question. So, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, uh, power for these sort of mobile robot systems, and obviously this has been a big push now with humanoids because they're very power hungry relative, do you think some other technology is coming to save us? Is it going to be batteries? Is it going to be, I don't know, solar panels on the back of our robots? You know, are there, are there ways that we're going to both conserve power but also get more in the short to medium term? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm not saying that this is the only solution um, to, to have more energy efficient solutions. So I think it's an interesting one and there's lots of potential and I really want to bring it to uh, more application areas as well um, mm -hmm. just to see where you can have a unified system. Mm -hmm. But you're absolutely right. There's um, many, many other ways that we should uh, look out for. Um, and obviously it's a question as well on where your energy is actually consumed. Is mm -hmm. it in the processing? Is it in the actuation? Mm -hmm. And that, that's going to depend on the um, platform as well. Awesome. Okay. Thank you so much.